Hello, everybody. My name is Daryl Denard. I am the community affairs producer and host for iHeart Radio Shows, Chicago Speaks, as well as Chicago Insight, airing on WBAC V103, as well as WGCI and Inspiration 1390. It's my pleasure as we get ready to organize the podium this morning to serve as moderator for the all-important continuation of the topic of closing the wealth gap. I'm going to get ready to take my seat and introduce our August panel. It is a pleasure this morning to welcome our panel. To my immediate left, we have Robert Dunn, who is the president of Landmark Development. To his left, we have Helene Gay, or Gail, I should say, Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Community Trust. And at the end of the panel there, my good friend, Christopher Harris, Senior Founder of Bright Star Community Outreach, as well as Pastor of Bright Star Church and St. James Ministries. What we're going to try to do is to offer key insights that further the discussion that we had uh, with Professor Harris as well as Melody. And it's important because the reality is, as mentioned earlier, is that the rate wealth gap is expanding. As they were having their discussion, and I love some of the solutions that were brought forth, which we are going to try to develop. The reality is, is that when we talk about current CEOs, in terms of Melody Hobson, the current CEO of Walmart, 20 years ago, there were more black CEOs than there are now. Now, the Fortune 500 has expanded from 500 to now 1,000, or in reality, in a very real corporate sense, 2,000. But yet, a percentage-wise of black CEOs has actually shrunk from 20 and 30 years ago. Likewise, the wealth gap has expanded. A white family throughout America, and especially right here in what Professor Julius Wilson coined <laughs> hypersegregation that exists here in Chicago, the wealth gap is 10 times that for white families as opposed to a black family. And so as we begin our discussion here this morning, I would like for you to be, because we are very respective of your time this morning, we're grateful for that. I ask that you be succinct as possible in terms of your responses so we can try to get as much information out uh, to the people that are in attendance this morning. First thing I really want to do is offer a baseline definition of what is wealth. Professor Harris talked about home ownership is a sign of wealth, all right? But what actually is wealth, especially here in the United States of America? Robert. Well, I think there's, you know, there's many ways to measure wealth. Uh, and, and I think particularly at a time like this where we're seeing the erosion of wealth before our eyes, last 24 hours. We've seen an increase in interest rates. Yes. We're seeing inflation at a pace that almost no one in this room has seen in our career or our lifetime. There's an overall erosion of wealth. And where is that erosion being felt most significantly? It's at that end of the wealth spectrum that can least afford it. So what we're seeing is a wealth gap that's been generations in the making that inevitably is growing at a pace right now faster than we've ever seen it grow before. To your point, every statistic exactly. that you pointed to shows an increasing growth in the wealth gap. So if we say, how do we measure what is wealth? I think the bottom line of what is wealth, we need something that is sustainable in a way that over time, generationally, there's an increase in the ability of what's affordable foundationally in terms of how a person can live their life. And what we're seeing right now before our eyes, we're working in reverse. Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, just to add to that, uh, you know, I guess I would just say it's, it's what you um, have with you, assets that you have with you over the long term. We focus a lot on, you know, we've talked a lot of, um, in this country about the income gap. Well, income is a slice of time. That's very different than having assets that uh, you can borrow against, that you can send your children to school with, things that, that you know, are that, that you own essentially versus things that are short term temporary. And I think, in, in, uh, to Professor Harris Perry's point, you know, the ability to not have that wealth stripped away as well to debt. And I think we often think about the accumulation side, how do you actually through home ownership, small business development, uh, income, savings, et cetera, how do you accumulate wealth? But you're, if you're in a situation where that wealth gets stripped, then you know that's a very different thing. So you know, I think wealth. You know, I, I always think of it as income is a slice in time. Wealth is that long-term accumulation of assets that you can use in all sorts of things, oftentimes to create more wealth, which is what we often see, and why we have this you know uh, compounded negative wealth for those who never had it to begin with. And those who had it compounded increased wealth because once you have it, it can continue to grow. Is there a real difference, Pastor Harris, in terms of making more money and having the trappings of that, whether it's the Bentley or your pockets look like they got clumps because you're so cash rich <laughs> and real wealth? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. And and thank you for having this uh, conversation uh, to my colleagues today. Um, let me just say this. When we think about wealth, it tends to not be redundant. It is you know, the accumulation of assets. And I'd like to also say it's what black people gave white people in this country that we feel great and something to benefit from. Uh, I think it is important that we understand that a lot of people don't even understand what wealth really is. Uh, if I'm able to pay my bills, if I'm no longer going from paycheck to paycheck, uh, if I have more than what another person has, uh, in my opinion, that's not real wealth. Uh, what I call wealth is what the Bible calls wealth, right? When you have the ability to leave an investment or an inheritance to your children and your children's children, and your children down to the next level, that's what I call wealth. So if I'm rich, that's just for me. But if I'm wealthy, my money lives beyond my death. So what role does the institutions that we have represented here, whether it be the church, whether it be philanthropic organizations, or whether it be development organizations, what responsibility, Robert, does the corporate slash developmental side of our economy, what role do they play in opening doors as opposed to closing doors to entrance into those spheres of development and along with that wealth creation. I want to pick up on a theme that I heard from Professor Harris Perry earlier. When we talk about leveling the playing field, closing the wealth gap, I think the first thing that we need to see, not just in corporate America, but in finding a balance between the institutions that really can create transformational change, the private sector can do a lot. But I think where we have to start the discussion is we have to recognize the cost of inequity, not just in society, but in our communities. You know, you can go back, I, I've heard a lot of discussion, a lot of statistics. There's a lot of measurements. And frankly, they're all bad. They're all bad. We talk about wealth. Wealth really, you measure it, wealth is, can I afford more tomorrow? Can I leave something behind to the next generation? Wealth is growth over time. Well, when we've got the cost of inequity that is a massive drain on the ability to create and grow wealth, until we recognize that as the underpinning of the failure of building wealth in key segments of the community, we can't solve the problem. If together between the private sector, the public sector, the community, we can understand where that real cost comes from, 
and we can begin to find structural changes that can begin to address the cost of inequity. If we can get there, then we can establish ways and avenues where we can create wealth within the community. It really starts there. You know, someone made the comment earlier, I believe it was Professor Harris Perry, said, you know, when you look at these programs, they're cyclical. If we can attack the cost of inequity, that's not cyclical. That's generation. And I think uh, I would agree with that in part, but facts don't lie, as they say. And the reality is I've been in this game a long time, whether it be broadcasting or particularly journalism around the reality of diversity. And there was more wealth building, true wealth building, during President Nixon through affirmative action and things that people don't like to say because we're so semantically bamboozled nowadays in terms of quotes. And the reality is, is that when you look, CEO Gale, at the policies from the 70s to the 80s, there was more black wealth creation during that time when corporations had to be put to the fire and say, you know what? We want to see diversity created. We want to see opportunity created, and we want it measurable. All of a sudden, through attrition, those particular goals have changed. Nobody wants to talk about quota because of a philosophy of reverse discrimination. And so, what was then existed to say, you know what? You guys are making so much money at the corporate level that we want you to at least set aside, based on the population of this country, set aside opportunities to those that have been disenfranchised. And what do they do? They come in and they say, no, we don't like that word anymore. We're going to make goals. No, we don't want goals anymore. We're going to change it from diversity to diversity and inclusion. But yet the facts don't lie. Numbers that are based on facts don't lie. Diversity and inclusion right now produces less wealth than it did 20 years ago. To that end, Tony, what role does organizations like the Great Chicago Community Trust play in helping to ensure that there is equity among the corporate citizenship that reaps profits for the people that they serve? Yeah, so you you raised a few points, and I will answer that uh, specific question maybe last. But I, you know, a couple of points you raised. First of all, you know, I think that we tend to come in and out of fads and phases, and don't have consistency over time. And I think some of the lack of consistency and the starts and stops uh, don't help what we're talking about. We need to have long-term vision around where, what is the world, to your point, what is it that we want to create, uh, because we know that it will benefit all of us and all of our society when we hold if we, in fact, deal with some of those issues. I think the other thing, and, and uh, was pointed out several times in the previous conversation, you know, we think about this so talk from an individual level. And if we keep thinking about, you know, how many individuals hold certain roles, we really are not going to have some change. I'm, I'm thrilled that Ralph Brewer is where she is and that Melanie Hobson is where she is, because it does matter that their voices are in the room, and they do make a difference. But one or two people that we hold up as, you know, we made progress is just not enough. We do have to have the kind of policy change that long term looks at how do we redress the issues that got us here to begin with. You know, and, and we often say yeah, that it's poor public policy that got us where we are today. Therefore, good public policy is critical if we're going to make a difference. So for us as a philanthropic organization, we're realistic. We have a certain amount of resources. We're relatively large for this, for this region. We will never close the racial and ethnic wealth gap by ourselves. We have to have partners. And so, you know, we try to uh, shine a light on issues. We try to use our voice. We try to use our influence. And we try to use our dollars in ways that can catalyze change. But we also try to do it in an integrated way uh, because, again, I think we're, we're so used to saying, you know, if we can just educate enough people, that will make a difference. If we can just buy enough homes, that will make a difference. If we can just do X, Y, and Z. We got to integrate this. We have to think about, you know, are we investing in the same neighborhoods that we want people to buy homes in so the home values actually increase over time and not decrease? So we have to really have this. Are we making sure that the voices of residents are at the table with this? 
picking, you know, specific things that we think um, are the fashion of the day. So the immediate question that I have for you before we move to Pastor Harris is what year are we in currently under your leadership in terms of that 10-year plan? I want to know about it so that way my children, my children and grandchildren can benefit from whatever I do. Well, I think we're about three years into it. <laughs> um, you know, so we're three years into uh, a seven, you know, we have seven years left. And uh, again, and honestly, I think, you know, this is going to be the work that we do for the foreseeable future because at the end of the day, we're not going to fix the violence issue, we're not going to fix the education issue, the um, life expectancy gap, none of those things are really going to be focused to change if we just focus on one issue as opposed to this very core fundamental issue that I think um, you know, is, is really at the root of so many of the issues we deal with. As a conglomerate, the church, not only at an influential level, but also as an economic industry, is the largest, most powerful institution in the black community. And even though I am middle class, Professor Harris, I do pay ties. I do. I have to put that out there. <laughs> but uh, the, the reality is, is that is the church doing enough? Because I know that you were instrumental in terms of some of the work that you're doing with regard to Bright Star and the community development, also helping to get the brand new. Uh, Northwestern satellite and media care facility built across from the Walmart. Uh, that was through partnering at the corporate level with the church institution. Yeah, you know, I always say this, I think it's hard to help black people with broke people. And I create relationships that turn into resources for the residents within my reach. To answer your question, I don't think the church has done enough. Um, Especially nowadays. Nowadays it's about how many members you got docked, how many folks are watch, watching your services, and things like that. And we stay within the four walls of the church. And I think that's really unfortunate. Uh, if we ever get to the place where we are able to articulate what we need and what we want, as much as we articulate what we don't have, then I think we'll start to move forward. That's the first thing. Second thing, a lot of people in this country got rich and gained finances off of our faith. I think black people forgive too fast. I think we let people off the mats too fast. George Shulman, or uh, George Floyd and Officer Shulman, right? People in this room, we marched, right? Lane, I let march 10,000 people in Bronzeville. The first people I called, give me was some black women. Black women get done. <laughs> That's done. I didn't call the preachers first. I called Lee, I called Karen, and I called Mel. The Lord told me to mark. And they started to help me to build that effort. And it wasn't just about George Floyd. It was about the systemic injustice that black people have been dealing with for years, hundreds of years, for millennia. And it's, it's unfortunate. And I think the churches have to go back to coming uh, outside the four walls. Like we always say, when worship ends, service begins to our community. HBCUs started in churches. Economic development is happening in churches. Uh, it's not just wealth accumulation, it's also debt release. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we got with a Jewish synagogue and a couple months ago, and we raised enough money, and we were able to uh, release the debt, medical debt, for 2,300 families in Chicago, up to two million dollars. And people, and, and I have to put it, I think that but you're doing something that, the, that was actually instituted in Detroit, yeah. where there were several dedicated young individuals, many of them white, that realized that when you default on your medical bills, a hospital writes those off. And then they sell them to, and this is one reason I'm spending a little time here, is yep. because, as Professor Harris had talked about, is the reality is we're encumbered in terms of trying to reduce the wealth gap, 
because we're so encumbered by debt, whether it's medical debt, whether it's educational debt, uh, whether it's debt in terms of trying to help out a family member, and what this organization decided to do with us, correct me if I'm wrong here, is that they went to a specific zip code and said, oh, there are certain people in this zip code that have medical debt that's already been sold to the creditors at 5%. 5%, so let's say you have a $100,000 bill, hospital bill that you owe, and that you've defaulted on. Then what are you able to do with that? You're able to, once that goes into default, the hospital realizes you're probably not going to get any return on that. They go and sell it to these scavenger collection agencies. They buy for 5 maybe 10% of what the original debt is, and then they hound you with letters asking for additional fees to what you were trying to pay before. And even if they get, let's say, 10% from you, that's 100% profit to what they have. So these wonderful individuals decided, this is all about closing the wealth gap. They said, what if we buy that debt? What if we act like those scavenger collection agencies, buy the debt, and then free those people in that particular zip code from that debt that they had? And so the church, instead of just talking about Jesus, talk about jobs. Right? Instead of just talking about ministry, talk about money. Right? And we decided to do that, built a collaborative, and now 4,100 residents uh, obtain household sustaining income, housing families, personal uh, financial skills, uh, which is amazing, and education. Uh, 300 people have established uh, banking relationships due to the church coming outside the four, wall, four walls. And so instead of always asking them to give money, we need to take the time to first make sure they get some money. That's really what the responsibility is. Robert, talk to me about the role that residential commercial development plays in creating wealth opportunities for black folks. The reason I say that is because I'm from uh, born in Harlem, raised in the Bronx, and it's you know it really hurts me that when you look at gentrification, all right. It's based on concentric circles. You have the inner city, and then people expand. You know, they say, we don't want to live here anymore because that's where all the slums are. And so what happens is that the immigrant communities come to where the slums are that used to be. It's called inner city because that's where the city was first built. All the people rich, they move out to the suburbs. Then all of a sudden, it just grows in concentric circles. And because of that, what happens is that there are opportunities that have been relatively referred to it in terms of the gap area that was so hot. Why? Because it was close to downtown. And then all of a sudden, black folks say, well, I want to get out of the city because of the crime and everything else like that, and my uh, taxes are too high, they're a homeowner. They move out to the suburbs, and then what happens? People come and say, wow, all the infrastructure is not in the suburbs, it's in the inner city. The new development is going in the suburbs right now. There's more new development, Robert, happening in the city. What advice do you have for anybody, going back to what Professor Harris said, in terms of having property, what should they do with that property, even if it's difficult for them to pay the taxes on? Well, there's a lot of answers to that question. I'm going to give you a few uh, very directly, and this really builds off the partnership that we've created with the Urban League and, and really with the leadership of, of Karen Freeman Wilson. Uh, we know the problem. I mean, we spent the morning talking about all the different elements that over generations have created this problem. Undeniable. What are we going to do about it? Yeah. What can we do in this room to move forward and begin to address this problem in a measurable, meaningful way that has scale? Well, I, I can speak very directly about what I know here in Chicago. We're involved in a project, One Central. It's a massive undertaking. Beginning, it's a nearly $4 billion infrastructure investment that can lead to, over time, what could be tens of thousands of jobs and many billions of dollars of additional private investment in the core of the city. And we know one thing, in the history of this country, we have proven 
the most expensive way to grow our cities is to grow away from the core. And worldwide, we're now beginning to see the reorganization of our cities in a way we've never seen before. So what can we do? How can we take meaningful strides toward addressing the core issue that is the subject of today's discussion? Let me frame that a little bit. With One Central, we formed a partnership with the Urban League. And in my early meetings with Karen, we talked about several fundamental things. Number one, to have impact, we need to work at scale. Talking in millions of dollars is not going to begin to close the wealth gap issue. You think about it. What has happened over time in Chicago, and really all cities, that has led to this issue of wealth gap? Public policy has taken growth north and west of the city. Public investment has followed that public policy. Right. Private investment then follows where the public investment in core infrastructure occurs. I dare to say, if O'Hare were built southwest, not northwest, these neighborhoods would not have the economic makeup that they have today. It's just factual. And so if that's the pattern that has led to opportunity, because we know where investment goes, that is where the opportunities will occur, whether it's public or private. So with One Central, we formed a program called Equity Works with the Urban League, with the BLC, and with the Illinois Hispanic Chamber. And it has three fundamental components. What can we do? Part one, what we call Community Development Corporation. We have a $4 billion first phase of investment that will create tens of thousands of jobs, minutes from the south side, and at its heart build the transportation infrastructure that was taken away from the south side. Meaning, when the job opportunities went north and west, there was no infrastructure built to give people that reside on the south and west side access to those jobs. This reverses all of that. It creates a connection between Metro, CTA, in time Amtrak, and something we call the Shy Line, which is a circulator system to connect all points in the core of the city. Within that, it creates an opportunity for 100,000 residents on the south and west side, gives them the ability get to a job in a normal 30-minute commute. Today, that commute by, might be an hour and 45 minutes twice a day. So within the Community Development Corporation program, point number one is how do we remove the barriers to entry? So there's fundamental things we can do with a project like this that has scale. Number one, for emerging companies, provide the insurance, the bonding, and most importantly, the working capital that emerging companies need to be able to participate in a project that's measured in billions of dollars, not millions of dollars. Number two, we've created what we call the, the community training and, and uh, education program. We will not train and educate people. But if we're creating thousands of jobs that we know years in advance what those jobs are going to be, how do we tether those job opportunities to people that reside in the community? How do we open up the line of communication so that those that reside in the community that are in eighth grade, freshmen in high school, come through the high school years, graduated, didn't graduate, how do we create an exposure for them to the job opportunities that are coming and get them aligned with the training and education that they need in order to pursue those career opportunities? Point three, our community investment program, and this is really something that was led by Karen. We have a massive infrastructure project. It gives us the ability to take some of what are normally earnings through a program we call ESG, which is dominant in the capital markets today, and bring some of that investment back into the communities, namely to invest in workforce affordable housing tied to transit so that people can create their own wealth in the community over time. Those are fundamental things that, that we can do bringing together public and private sector investment in the core of the city, building core infrastructure that can create pathways, opportunity for people that reside there to create and sustain growth over time. There's a problem that says the head and the heart lead the body. So these initiatives that you just mentioned that are all commendable, were they instituted by you or was it uh, collaboration in terms of the 
for the developers. Who really is the one that's effective to change? Yeah, we, uh, on one central three years ago, we passed legislation with the state to create a public private partnership. You know, and, and I would underscore the key to any initiative like this. I mean, one central and equity works can't solve the problem, but it is a it is a different way to approach the problem with scale. And so we wrote into legislation the Equity Works program by name. But it did not have, it does not have definitions in state law. Where we went from there was to begin to approach the urban league, to approach the LC, to approach the Illinois Hispanic Chamber. And there were some, you know, I think important fundamentals in beginning to build the program. Number one, it has to have scale, you know, or its impact won't be number two, which is measurable. Number three, it has to be felt in the community. The impact can't be measured by about billions of dollars, tens of thousands of jobs. You know, how do we get into the community so that the impact is felt at an address on 81st Street? And the last point, really, to address your question is its governance. Its governance has to be grounded in the community. It has to be governed by participation from the urban league, the BLC, you know, community-based organizations. It can't be something that's brought forth as a private sector initiative and we're going to do good for the community. Those are cyclical programs. We need generational, sustainable programs. And to get there, ultimately, its governance has to reside in the community. And the only other thing that I would add to your list of objectives there when it comes to uh, collaborating with minority owned businesses during this development process is that you also ensure that those small vendors get paid on time. Because it's nice to have the work, but they're usually at a stage where they have to pay out of their pocket those people who they subcontract. Uh, I say that because that's important. In addition to the bonding, in addition to the insurance and things like that, another real need that many minority uh, corporations have is that they're getting paid quickly. It's a dominant issue, and, and uh, Karen can attest to this. We spent a lot of time talking about this. And if there's a contractor in the room, I'll apologize in advance for what I'm about to say, but <laughs> this is the way it goes. Uh, within our program, we joint check everyone that works on a, on a building aspect of the project. Like this. And why do we do that? It's to ensure that two things. The working capital is provided that, that emerging companies have to have to participate in projects of scale. But along with that, we have to have certainty that those businesses are getting paid, not just in a timely manner, but in an accelerated manner. And the best way for us to do that is we joint chat. I mean, I'm giving you a sort of at the ground level. What can we do to have impact? It's as simple as things like joint checking everything. I could get on my phone and in the next 30 seconds I could tell you every business that is working for our company right now on any major project exactly when they'll get paid next month. Why can I, how can I do that? I don't pay the contractor once a month X million dollars and the contractor pays everybody downstream. I cut 275 checks to that contractor and that contractor's name and the name of every side. Why do we do that? It's a measure of control so that we know that the businesses that need to maintain cash flow are maintaining cash flow and there's not someone in between because they're not keeping pace on a school project down the street, they're withholding pay. I want to get Pastor Harris, can I just say one thing? If, you know, I'm excited about this, but I think one of the challenges is it's great to give jobs. Imagine saying to the black town, you help us to build this, we're going to help you to build a business. Right? I think one of the, uh, we find a lot of times when these big efforts, a lot of uh, projects are happening in Chicago, and they always say, we can't find the black talent. Right? In the proactive way, who's training and equipping them now to make sure that they are able to not only be able to qualify to get those jobs later, but how do we also pour into them? An opportunity to build those businesses, and you know, I mean, my family's from Gulf Coast, Mississippi, and they didn't just have jobs, right? Granddad was a plumber, right? 
some kind of way they either had clients or they created a business. I hope that with this generation now, we would talk more about how to make sure those who have the skills, have the talent, have the education and the experience, let's help them build a business and not just in, you know, enable them to build a building in a community that is not theirs. Because we need those talents after they build where those great things are downtown to build up things in their own community on the south and the west side of Chicago. I want to know, Tony, uh, in terms of, and I'm really just like just throwing out the question here, uh, would you literally tell our audience, because so many times we hear about the Chicago Community Trust in terms of the roundtable discussions and other initiatives that you do. Can you inform us in terms of, in addition to what you said earlier, what specifically are you doing in this regard programmatically and also from a philosophical point to make sure that you're working in the best interest of black and brown communities and disenfranchised communities here in Chicago? Yeah, I'll answer that and I'll also um, make a couple of comments on, on uh, what was previous. So, you know, as I said, we, we developed a strategy about, uh, we launched about three years ago We have three primary uh, areas of focus. One, growing household wealth. How do you make sure that people have opportunities for um, good careers and income? Uh, to make sure that they have the right opportunities for training. And if they, if they uh, go to school, they don't come out too far in debt. How do you make sure that people they have uh, resources to turn those resources into long-term assets through things like home ownership um, and entrepreneurship, investments, etc. So really, you know, um, how do you help a small business person who might not have the network and the ecosystem that they need to be able to make sure that that small business, uh, with your great idea, actually is able to produce revenue? And I can go on and on, but you know, how do you at the household level try to increase wealth and, and you know, the third part of that is making sure that the debt doesn't uh, staff and, and get the wealth away. So at the household level, then we do a lot of the neighborhood level, really looking at how do we help to work with the private sector to in, invest in neighborhood business investment, and can we use our capital in a way that will drive resources in and take care of the things that oftentimes developers, even public sector dollars, won't do in terms of you know, everything from can you get the right permits on time and do you have the right kind of legal advice and are you able to take site control and all these things to be able to uh, invest in neighborhoods and then as, you know, as I mentioned how do you make sure residents are at the table uh, you know we support as an example a network of young change makers you know, people who are in the community community activists how do we make sure that the narratives we do a lot of investing in, in local um, media to make sure that the, the, the narratives and the stories that come up are in the voices of the people themselves. And then, you know, fourth is throughout all of this, how do we really look at aspects of policy change again? Because I think, you know, we can, we can demonstrate what works um, through our dollars, but if we can really change policies, you know, we were very much a part of helping this coalition that put a cap on predatory lending. You know, we had one of the highest predatory lending rates here in Illinois that uh, is now the cap is 36%, still too high, so a lot better than 300%. So if you're a poor person and have to take out a payday loan, expansion of the earned income tax credit, you know, huge. We know it's a poverty fighter. We know it helps to put, um, you know, a, a stable footing, financial stability, uh, and, you know, helps to expand who had access to that. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that we're involved in. But again, I just want to go back to, and I think your example is a wonderful example. But we've got to think beyond individuals. And I think this is in no way uh, saying, you know, what you are doing is a huge opportunity to expand. But we really do have to think about where are the pressure points. And when I think about, um, you know, private sector, you know, we don't do enough with the investor community. You know, it is the investor community that oftentimes is what a lot that sets the tone of what companies will and will not do. We haven't done 
young adults to look at, you know, even just our basic core of how we're made up as a, as a country and what does having such a strong individual profit motive do for really uh, being able to address some of the issues that we're talking about. And when companies are forced to squeeze prices uh, to be able to increase their revenues, and that's what they're judged on, it's hard to say that one great example is going to change that. So I, you know, I keep going back to what I think is at a, a very core level about how we are constructed, what are our incentives in our society, and where can we have the leverage points that will make the biggest difference to making those changes. Final thoughts, Pastor Harris? Well, I'm really um, excited about the discussion. My question is always, what's next? Right? Uh, we can come together annually, or we can figure out how we can come together monthly, and then hold ourselves accountable to get stuff done. Because at the end of the day, it has to go beyond conversation. It has to go beyond just the words. And once we get informed, right, the scripture is clear, faith without works is dead. And we got to do something. And there's nothing more frustrating than coming back every year to hear the same words, but nothing gets done here. And I just want to say, We've, we've heard some great examples. How do we take those examples and multiply those? And that's where I think the, the real goal is at this point, is how do we continue to spread the word, use good examples, and make a real difference, and that our long-term is sustainable. Well, I can tell you that one of those ways to spread the word is that I will be having you on our conference. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is not really something. Uh, Pastor Harris knows that he gets the call to come on early, and uh, we'll also talk Robert about uh, this landmark development. Also, before I hand it over to our illustrious president and CEO, uh, I want everybody right now to look at their table in terms of one down. Look at, pick it up, please pick it up. This is a participatory event. Turn it around. Use your phone right now to scan that code to find out more information about everything that we talked about, plus the bios of all of these wonderful people that have spoken. I thank you so much for joining us this morning.